time to start. Uh, it is my enormous pleasure to introduce uh, Lance Essaman and then Meredith Patterson. And I should tell you about how we met. We were in uh, Berlin at a hacker conference. And hacker conferences are fun. But what I did not expect to happen at all is to hear uh, a theory paper, possibly uh, um, the strongest theory paper I heard about, presented at that conference to that crowd and that crowd listening rapidly. Because what really happens in this world is that there are theoreticians and hackers um, do not really listen to them that much because theory of computation or um, formal languages theory or automata theory, how does it really help write that zero day that will take over the world? It doesn't really, right? On the other hand, uh, there are theoreticians who are concerned with what is computable, what is decidable, where you can uh, hope to write a program that actually addresses the problem, the issue, and where it's beyond all hope. By the same token, uh, they come up with bulletproof ways of doing things in uh, languages that no one uses in reality. And uh, well, whereas hackers do some sort of bit level flipping of, of well bits, and it, everything they do is uh, probably ad hoc and who cares anyway. So uh, there is this huge disconnect between those two cultures. Here is an effort that shows how to bridge that gap. Here is an approach that shows the hackers how one can use intuitions from theory of computation of formal languages to find that huge hole that everyone has been overlooking in things that people use all the time and that are supposedly say, secure cryptography, which we all know makes things immediately better. Uh, on the other hand, uh, here is uh, um, a theory that so here is a theory helpful to hackers. On the other hand, here is a very clear reduction of what is a hack to the basic fundamental computer science intuitions. So with that, I will give uh, uh, Len uh, and Meredith uh, the chance to uh, tell the story. Uh, Len is at the University of Catholic, Catholic University of Leuven. Um, Meredith is uh, an independent researcher and uh, uh, working in industry. Um, I was I was actually going to refer to your um, uh, biohacking and okay. other uh, uh, pursuits. So apparently there is uh, a lot of hacking that you can do with biological systems. Highly Oh, let me make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, Rather than telling their story, I would like to tell it. It's a great story. I love telling it. <laughs> As you probably got the phone right. <laughs> okay. Um, is the mic on? No. But I think it's a pretty small room. I'm getting a nod. I'm getting a no. It's on. It's on. Tell me to shout if you can't hear me. All right. So we're, um, we're a team of researchers, as Sergey was saying, working on uh, this topic we're calling language theoretic security. Uh, it's a term that we came up with to describe this class of, of thinking. Uh, I'd like to start out here with a, with a quote from Mr. Horror, Dr. Horror. We've, you, would, you would think that this would be common sense, but it's not. Uh, it seems to be a, an intuition that has eluded many programmers and protocol designers. If you, if you have a program that uh, doesn't behave the way the user expects it to, it's not going to be able to accomplish the intentions of the user. When people go to open up their mail, for instance, they don't intend for that program to have complete rights over their system and install spam and advertising software. And they certainly don't expect it, but because of lax protocol design, we wind up with that happening all the time. Basic communications model here. You have a sender and a receiver, a speaker and a listener. Alice and Bob. 
four items here, and you can have a disconnect between all of them. You know what Alice thinks, and then what Alice says. These two need to be equivalent. Sometimes they're not. What Bob hears is another level of indirection where ambiguity and misunderstanding can creep in. And then, of course, what Bob understands. Each of these steps needs to correspond to the previous. And this translates directly to machine level protocols, the actual data that machine one has corresponding to its encoding, it's equivalent to Alice's situation. And then when that encoded data is passed to machine two, how it parses it and what it produces at the end is equivalent to Bob's problem. Now, these two items here, machine two's parsed data and what we originated with should be identical. Often, though, they're not. This is important. So we're going to back up here and try to describe a little bit of how we came to the current theory we have that starts with Meredith's work on SQL. Right. So back in 2005, I was looking at the problem of SQL injection. Um, typically, when people try to figure out how to prevent SQL injection, you know, which types of inputs they should accept and which ones they should reject, they, they use either reg regular expression whitelisting or blacklisting. So they'll try to come up with some complicated regular expression or some set of regular expressions that accurately describes inputs that we want to, or inputs that we want to kick out, or you want to, you want to do the same thing and just try to describe the set of inputs that you're willing to accept. Now, the problem with doing this for for SQL is that SQL is not a regular language. If you try to use a regular expression, you know, a deterministic finite automata, to validate a context-free language, this is always going to fail. The pigeonhole principle says that you're always going to be able to pass some input that you weren't supposed to be able to, or conversely, that your, that your whitelist is going to reject inputs that should have been acceptable. So the technique that we came up with involves looking at the looking at the kinds of queries that the developer was expecting because that's something that the that's something that the developer can specify beforehand. You know that you want to have say a query that checks to see whether the user's account exists. You know that you want to have queries that retrieve data that, uh, that the user that's, who's logged in is allowed to see. So you can specify these beforehand, and you can pre-generate parse trees for them. Then when users start submitting information through your web form and you construct a query, you can parse those on the fly and examine whether the parse tree of the queries that you've synthesized matches one of those allowable queries or not. If you have non-terminals that, uh, that differ, then that suggests that an attacker is trying to inject a new clause. He might be trying to inject a malicious condition, such as uh, an or clause that always resolves to true, or he might be injecting a malicious command, like terminating the the like terminating the the current query and issuing a new statement, like drop database, and then just commenting out the rest of it. So here's an example of that. This is a parse tree that looks like what the you know that looks like what the developer was expecting. All that's supposed to be submitted is a password, and indeed that's what you have. Note that this is going in between in between quotes here because that's part of what the, the that that's part of what the form adds to it since it's a since it's a string literal. But if you do something like this, 
terminate the string literal early and add in an or clause that's missing the other end quote, you end up creating this completely different looking parse tree with extra clauses in it. That tree is not isomorphic to, to that tree, and therefore we reject this. All right, so one thing that we, that we, one idea that we took out of this was the notion that it is necessary to validate an input language with a computational mechanism that is at least as strong as the language that you're validating. And if you have syntactic differences between inputs, that, mean, that guarantees that you're going to have semantic differences as well, because you're adding, you're adding extra elements of information to the input. So parsing is basically your last line of defense against malicious input entering the system. If your parser allows bad input through, then there's not a whole lot you can do beyond that. All right, so that works great for context-free languages, but what about context-sensitive languages? As it turns out, the vast majority of protocols that are used on the internet today are context-sensitive, not context-free. Uh, HTTP, um, ASN1, quite a lot of crypto protocols, um, they're all over the place. Generally, as a rule of thumb, if it's got a length field in it, it's going to be context-sensitive. Um, and, and we'll get into why that is in just a moment. Um, so back in 2006, Daniel Bleckenbacher presents an amusing little forgery attack on uh, the PKCS1 padding scheme for RSA signatures. So normally, an RSA sig so, so a PKCS1 signature is going to be as wide as, in, in octets, the, the, the size of the modulus. Um, and let's take a look at what that looks like. So it starts off with some padding bytes. Why they did this, I don't know. This was kind of ridiculous. But you've got some amount of padding. You've got a tag that indicates what hash function is being used. And then you've got a hash. So MD5 is shorter than SHA-1, so obviously you're going to have less padding in a SHA-1-based signature than you would in an MD5-based signature, assuming that the moduli are the same. So the way this attack worked, um, instead of just the, instead of the actual hash, um, you would insert a bunch of extra garbage at the end so that the resulting value was still uh, a power of your exponent. Now, this attack worked best for E equals 3. We think 5 might also have worked. Um, 2 to the 16th plus 1 is probably going to be pretty safe. Um, the problem here was, and this, this actually happened in the wild in OpenSSL. So the way that they wrote their parser, it started out, it, it, it looked for the sequence of bytes that indicated this is the start of padding. So the, that sequence was you know, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then you have just a bunch of FFs, then another 0, 0, and then, the, and then your ASN1 structure and, your, and the hash start. So the problem is, if you don't make sure that the number of padding bytes is correct with respect to the hash function that you're using, if you just blindly consume padding bytes, which is what they actually did, this is basically equivalent to a deterministic finite automata. It's saying, you know, it's saying FF Cleany star plus token plus another token. So the reason why, let, let, let's look at the context sensitivity of this. Um, so this is an attribute grammar. Uh, Don Knuth came up with these back in the 70s, and they're basically just augmented context-free grammars. What are they augmented with? Properties of the terminal, uh, properties of the terminals, basically. So for the padding, you have a property P, which is the length of the padding terminal. Uh, you've got one for the tag as well, and another one for the hash. The condition at the top is, the, is where the validation comes in. So if P plus T plus H is not equal to M, the size of the modulus, then that means that the, uh, the, the parse is incorrect. 
So it turns out that you know this this could have been you know this this, this could have been this could have been done correctly if they were actually paying attention to what size the hash is actually supposed to be, what size the the padding is actually supposed to be. You can't do this with uh, with deterministic finite automata because there's no way to keep track of state. But in this case, you just start collecting state at the bottom, and it percolates all the way up to the top. So we can do this for context-sensitive languages as well as for context-free. So going back to our, our communications model that we discussed at the beginning, what was said was a signature that was not actually grammatical. That's, that's what got emitted. Uh, the signature was too long, it had garbage in it, and there wasn't enough in the way of padding bytes. Um, what we heard, or what, what, OpenSSL, what OpenSSL heard was well, the string was the right length, right? You know, we don't we don't really care that the number of padding bytes was wrong, and that the and that the and, and that the the number of bytes in the hash was wrong. We we just know that overall the number was right. That's because that's all they were paying attention to, and because of this, it interpreted it as a valid signature. So, what we've learned here is number one: if you rely on an implementation that has the ability to interpret an invalid string as valid, you're doing it wrong. PKCS1 is well formally specified, at least insofar as ASN1 is. There, there's quite a bit of ASN1 in there. Um, this could have been done correctly. It wasn't. People like to hand roll parsers. There, there's this myth, this very persistent myth in computer, in, well, not so much in computer science, but, but certainly in industry, that, that parsers are heavy and slow and, you know, and that you have to hand roll a parser if you want to get any actual speed. This is actually flat out wrong. Um, Matt Might at the University of Utah um, had a recent paper called Yak is Dead. Um, and one of the things that he talks about in that paper is, uh, is actually dispelling this myth completely. He, he went to the trouble of testing this out and found out that no, actually, if you generate a parser and use it, your you're, CPUs are fast enough these days that the amount of overhead is really not so bad. So we know that scripting languages, file formats, network protocols, message formats, these are all formal languages. If you look in the back of uh, pretty much any RFC, you will see a nice EBNF notation of the protocol that's being used. So it's, it's necessary to generate your parser from this. It's inexcusable that we don't, but no one does. Yeah. And because of this, what we end up with is a situation where every implementation is actually speaking its own weird little dialect of the protocol that it's supposed to be implementing. In practice, implementations have added in little extra tweaks to make sure that they're capable of handling outputs generated by, uh, by other implementations. But this, the, this doesn't necessarily help. That's and an attacker's playground right there. When you have mutually intelligible dialects that have differences between them, it's in that liminal space that the black hats just love to roll around in the mud. And here's a beautiful example of that. So when we talk about attack surfaces, we talk about the aspects of a protocol that, or of a computer system in general, where a malicious adversary can achieve some result that is contrary to the wishes of the user, contrary to the intentions of the designer, that benefits him in some way. This might be delivering an injection attack with SQL. It might be exploiting a buffer overflow to execute arbitrary code. Where the parser aspect comes in is that that's the gateway to inputs. That is the beginning of the attack surface for the adversary. So given that we have these areas of potential ambiguity between what is meant, what is expressed, what is received, and what is understood, the attacker can leverage these differences. Not always 
simply to confuse the recipient, but sometimes to play one implementation off of the other. We'll get to that in a couple more slides, I believe. Here's some examples of ambiguity you find in exploits over and over again. The key point here is when you have machine-to-machine -machine communication that can lead to exploits, it is, you cannot rely on the user to tell that there is an attack going on, that he is executing malicious code. When the user is not part of the protocol, they're not going to notice that something bad is happening. An attack that really delights me is the parse tree differential attacks. This is an example here of a multi-layered attack approach that is not obvious to any, any individual player involved. If you have two implementations that handle ambiguity in a protocol in different ways, and you can leverage this ambiguity to perform an attack by counting on the fact that your input, identical inputs in different situations, but your input will be processed and produce output A in the first case, output B in the second case, you can often avoid a lot of checks against a certain class of attacks by behaving correctly in the one case and then executing your, your malice in the second case. These are all examples of questions that implementers need to be asking when they're designing protocol implementations because they correspond directly to tricks we can use to cause uh, malicious behavior. It's the, and it's, the, uh, it's the points of variance, the areas of ambiguity that give us things like one of the major attacks we had in, in X509. A couple of years ago, we were working on applying a cryptographic attack against X509. X509 is the, is the standard that governs most PKI on the web. I'm pretty sure everyone here is familiar with that. But you have companies like VeriSign, certificate authorities, that certify individuals' identity when they go to request a key. And then because of this attestation from your certificate authority, coupled with trust in mathematics, belief that the cryptography will do what we think it will do, you can be assured that when this website says, I am PayPal.com, it really is PayPal.com. We were working on a purely traditional cryptographic attack, uh, exploiting problems in MD5 to get a root certificate <coughs> of our own. And another team beat us to the punch there, and we thought, well, we've done all this work here, and we found these disturbing things about the encoding. Let's see what else we can find. Let's see if we can leave the crypto alone and still subvert the system. We actually stopped finding zero days because the problems were just too many. We got to about a dozen and then started, we did write this up and present it. We found exploits that were a result of overflows, underflows. The null termination attack, somebody else actually independently found out of intuition. We found padding attacks. And many of these relied on leveraging the differences between implementations. So you have a, uh, when you're trying to, when you're applying for a certificate, you create this document called a CSR, Certificate Signing Request. It is a machine-readable, cryptographically signed request providing all the data that's going to go into a certificate in the format that the certificate authority is, uh, is expecting. So they parse this, verify that everything is provided correctly, they check and make sure that you're actually authorized to be requesting this certificate, and then they take that information you've provided in the CSR 
turn it into an X509 certificate, sign it, and then that's your X509 certificate. So if I want to go and request PayPal.com, if I just walk up to VeriSign or send them an email with a CSR that says PayPal.com, they're going to reject that because I don't own PayPal.com. I'm not authorized. But if I send them a CSR that is for a bunch of subdomains off of my personal domain, let's say I own hacker.com. They see that I own hacker.com, that means I'm, I'm legitimately requesting a certificate for a subdomain off of my main domain. If that happens to be www.paypal.com, null character, .hacker.com, that's no concern of theirs, right? Now the problem, of course, is because of parsing errors in all of the major browsers, when those browsers go and they fetch the website that I'm serving up from my rogue access point while I'm man in the middle people at a conference or as they're sitting here and no one is actually sitting here checking their bank account, like that's impressive. The browser parses that, they hit the, uh, the null character and they think null character, I'm done. Display the little lock icon with PayPal.com verified by VeriSign, bam, I've got them. Well, this would not be possible to actually execute if all the implementations parsed this the same way, but OpenSSL is implemented, ironically, most correctly because it doesn't treat the null character as anything special. It actually parses this whole string, sees badguy.com or hacker.com in my earlier example, and treats that as something I'm authorized to request. But because OpenSSL handles it this way, and IE and Firefox and uh, I believe the, the WebKit browsers as well, truncated at the null string, we're able to do the attack. Because we can leverage these differences here, we're able to completely fly under the radar of, this, of the certificate authority delaying the actual execution of our attack until it's produced a certificate that individual users are pulling up on their, on their site or on their uh, browser when they're going to our, our imitation PayPal site here. Now, that was the most banging your head into the desk, silly, how did we let this happen type attacks, but there were others with regard to parsing of the X509 ASN1 encodings too. ASN1 is a very, very many pages of technical specifications from a standards body that really ought to know better than to leave ambiguity in their specs, but they do. The CN field, the common name field, is what for all practical purposes, it's used in two cases. It's used in SMIME encodings, and in that case, it is the field that provides your email address. And it's used in SSL certificates, X-1 certificates, and it is the field that provides the name of the website, the actual URL of the website you're going to. There is no reason whatsoever to allow more than one common name. There are arguments that maybe we want to use the same certificate for two different sites, but in practice, it should be restricted to one. But the spec does not restrict it to one. It allows multiples. Of course, when it's being parsed, only one CN is expected, and there is no guidance whatsoever as to which CN to use if you're provided a certificate that has multiple CNs. I actually, we spent several months looking for any kind of guidance whatsoever of what to do in this edge case. And we found a document, I think it was an IDS document, saying that the implementer should use the most reasonable, <laughs> should do the most reasonable thing in this case. Well, obviously, if you're digging around looking for the answers to this, you don't, it's not reasonable to, you, to do one thing over the other and you want guidance, but it's not to be found. So when you have multiple implementations that have been done independent of each other and they're following these specs, the only thing that's going to keep them in sync is if 
there's no ambiguity. When there's ambiguity, you're going to find differences, and we found differences in this case. One browser picks the first one, because that's sensible, right? Once you have satisfied what's a CN, you don't need to keep looking. One browser has picked the last one. I haven't actually decompiled the code and figured it out, but I can guess pretty much how they came to that. They found a CN, filled the, val uh, filled the value, kept reading, oh, another CN, overwrite. And keep doing that till you're left with the last one and move on. And interestingly, I think it was IE that picked the middle one, if you had three. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you're now in a situation where if the code that the certificate authority is running to parse your CSR to generate your certificate authority, your, your certificate, it, it, say it picks the first one. Well, you put your innocuous hacker.com as the first one, the certificate authority checks it, says, yeah, that checks out. They issued the certificate without sanitizing the data, just passing in unparsed information you provided. Big mistake. You've got a major subset of the browsers out there which won't pick that one that's been verified. They'll pick your last one. That's where you put PayPal.com, and that's how you get rich. We found a tax specific to OIDs. O OIDs are the object identifier. That they are how the data is represented in this obtuse machine readable format that ASM1 provides. And unfortunately, they are treated. Yeah, that's the one you want. They're treated as integers in some implementations. So you can actually do math over these. These are just supposed to be unique identifiers for a given field, but Windows lets you do clever things like this. It was supposed to be a big int. Somebody screwed up and it's just a regular old, it, it's just four integers that are dot separated. So when you give it two to the 32nd plus three, it actually does that math and says, oh, that's three, cool, 2.5.4.3. That's a common name. And of course, since OpenSSL will do it differently, you've got another area here where there's probably still zero days in this code. But we just, we didn't bother to keep looking because there were just too many. So speaking of getting rich, what would be the market value of uh, each one of these zero days that you build basically a wonder mill for producing? I don't even know. Between 20,000 <laughs> and a million is the last data that's come out. They're, they're actually the market for unreleased zero days these days. And ones that target the X59 infrastructure are on the pricier side. Yeah, and we, we made sure to work with the vendors and get every single vulnerability that we found before we decided there were just too many and gave up patched. We, we sat on all of this and, got every, and made sure that everything got fixed. So we, we probably threw away about $20 million there. <laughs> uh, but, but now there was still more to be found. So what did you do to pass those off to the, you know, to the vendors? So that they we notified, we went and we, we spoke to CERT, which is the post Morris worm, deal with problems like this and deal with notification. And we talked to VeriSign, who runs a cabal of certificate authority and CA software vendors. And we let them handle the the notification of the 40 or 50 parties who were affected. Um, VeriSign and Microsoft worked with us pretty closely on this. They were, they were, they handled it well. I was, I have no complaints about how they handled this. And uh, some of some of the implementation teams working on fixing this found related attacks that that were that were patched. The the thing about the fact that we left zero days on the table is, and we're we're getting to this with, uh, with the overall message. If you verify formally your inputs and you assure, and ensure that, that your file formats and your protocols are modeled according to a grammar, it doesn't matter if there's other areas where this, these sort of attacks could happen further down in the code path because the malicious input never gets there. So. Because it's a, it's a never-ending problem to play whack-a-mole with these exploits. Something else has to be done. Then there was an entirely separate class of parser differentials on OpenSSL. When you have OpenSSL running in 
one mode versus a second mode, sometimes you can leverage differing behavior depending on how you're invoking OpenSSL. OpenSSL has, OpenSSL is a, a software toolkit for handling crypto operations and it's widely used in the, in the CA uh, industry. Often as a command line batch script processing solution. All of those parsers are it's a separate code path and the edge cases there you have enough, you have as much variation between implementation of X11 parsing in compat mode versus as a library as you do with a separate implementation completely. Because it, it was a different guy who wrote it at a different time and there are edge cases that appear there. So we were able to find, uh, find ways of tricking the command line, uh, the command line operation so that we could play CN games there. Of course, there's obscure flags you can use to normalize this, but at the end of the day, the, the end user, the administrator, the implementer, they're not going to go and become an expert in SS, OpenSSL exploit technique. They just want to get this deployed, set up, and get on with their business. Any XKCD fans in here? <laughs> this is a snippet from a phone call from an irate school administrator. Did you really name your student this SQL injection attack string? No, we call them little bobby tables. Well, some guys at a large certificate authority read this and they were smart enough to go, huh. Well, of course, when you're dealing with millions of certificates, you probably want to be storing them in a fashion that you can access them easily and manipulate the data. And well, SQL databases are good for this. So we have now a situation where a large business is storing blobs of user provided data in its SQL database without really thinking this is an attack vector here. They were vulnerable to SQL injection attacks from the certificates from various attribute fields and user-provided data that might not actually be parsed or used in any normal circumstance. But when it's put into the database, if it can, if it's parsed to be added to the, to the database, then we wind up with potential SQL injection there. So because of XKCD, they actually found two or three major SQL injection vulnerabilities that to their knowledge, hadn't been, uh, hadn't been exploited, but it's hard to tell. And it turns out there were a couple of different ways of doing that. The uh, Unicode encoding is another injection attack vector that most implementers are aware of and try to avoid using Unicode if they can until they can't, and then they have to, and they just they sacrifice goats or something because there's no good Unicode validation software out there that they can just drop in. Hand rolling it would be a nightmare. So if anybody wants to write that, there would be a lot of people who would love you for it. And of course, ASN1 is not just used for X509. It's, it's also used widely in SNMP, which is um, a uh, relied on heavily for the backbone routers that keep the internet running. Do you want to uh, explain the Protos? Right. So Protos is a project uh, that came out of a university in Finland. Um, and they basically decided to fuzz SNMP, focusing specifically on, uh, on ASN1 issues. Um, they tried a whole bunch of different SNMP implementations and found just literally hundreds of vulnerabilities completely automatically. However, the uh, basic encoding rules for ASN1 are incredibly lax and have a lot of, uh, they have a lot of play in them. PKCS1 actually changed its specification a couple of years ago. They require the use of the distinguished encoding rules these days, um, which gets rid of the possibility of, say, those crazy arithmetic encodings that we looked at a few minutes ago. 
So a question that uh, certificate authorities really need to be looking at is, did the Protoss project cover their ASN1 burr parser? Because it might not have. Uh, we didn't actually go and test all of the CA's parsers for them because that's just mean. And probably criminal. And probably criminal. But in general, if you're going to be, if you absolutely must use ASN1, do yourself a favor, use the distinguishing coding rules, get, get rid of Burr. The fact that Protoss could come up, could find so many vulnerabilities is alarming because fuzzing, there have been advances in fuzzing, but for the most part, fuzzing is not a methodical analysis. Fuzzing is an ad hoc analysis. Throw garbage at the system and analyze how it breaks and try to work back to where your problems are that way. Fuzzing doesn't, after you fuzz an application, find problems, fix it, run the fuzzer again, and have no problems. You haven't shown that your system is secure. You've shown simply that it's not going to fail based on the output of this fuzzing algorithm. And there, over the last 10 years, there have been a number of advances in more and more sophisticated fuzzing approaches, but they are, there is no formal methodology of analysis with a fuzzer. All right, so what have we learned from this? First of all, you can do an awful lot with the tools provided by a formal language theory to secure the software that you write. As long as you make sure to actually start from a formally specified protocol, then you have the ability to generate a provably correct parser for it and, and go on from there. We've also found that when people fail to do this, the attack surface is enormous. Now this is, this, is a, this is a really big problem in the real world because a tremendous number of scripting languages and formats that, uh, that are used every day are extremely underspecified. JavaScript is, is probably my favorite example just because there are so many things that are left up to the implementer. This really needs to not happen. And the other, thing, the other thing that this tells us is that it's really not even necessary, given the, state of the, given the state of the industry today, to waste your time trying to figure out, well, gee, how can I come up with a second pre-image attack on MD5? Because you just don't have to. You can skirt around it. And if you can trick one entity into certifying something about you, that you can then use to mislead another entity, crypto doesn't even matter. How did we end up in this situation? Uh, are you familiar with Postel's law? Uh, John Postel, the, he was the original RFC editor. His work with the IETF brought us to a world we, where we can have multiple different implementers implementing internet, internet connected network protocols, and it essentially all worked. Postel's law says, be conservative in what you generate and liberal in what you accept. And if you adhere to this wisdom, you wind up with implementations that don't do anything really crazy for the most part, but can recover when the implementation they're talking to does something a little bit out there. This, I'm not criticizing John Postel for... You love to. <laughs> well, had this not been the wisdom of the early implementations of the, of the internet protocols, we might not have such a, a varied and diverse and interoperable internet. It, it, we may not be where we are today if we hadn't done it that way. But what is clear is that this is well, no where longer... Where we are today is that it doesn't work at all. <laughs> well, no, for the most part, w things work far better than they should. They just break a lot. <laughs> but in the early days of, and this is, we're, we're talking about an era when encryption on the link level for authentication, why would you need that? Uh, passwords, passwords were optional. <laughs> the, the idea of having to worry about an attacker at all steps of your protocol design was not at the forefront, at least, in most implementer designs. Today, though, we need to be worried about 
any decision we're making, is this opening up an attack vector? And liberal in what you accept is a problem. Because if you're being liberal in accepting deviations from your, from your defined protocol, you are almost certainly then creating a new dialect of this implementation, opening yourself up to partial differentials. But even simpler than that, you're opening yourself up to malicious, you're opening yourself up to malicious data being provided by the attacker on the attacker's terms. We need to stop that. We need to continue to be conservative in what we generate and we send, but we need to be precise in what we accept. We need to validate inputs and reject inputs that do not adhere to the specified protocol as a matter of course. That's going to be easier than you might think at first glance because we have a distribution system for protocol specs. We have the RFCs. Providing a machine readable grammar specification for every protocol written, every file format written, it's a bit of work right now to catch up with all the past protocols that are out there, but that's a one-time cost. Already we almost have that in our RFCs. As Meredith mentioned, you have a lot of machine readable examples of protocols. Taking that one step further, providing this section of machine parsable protocol specification that a real protocol snapshot can be checked against is a minor bit of extra work that will save us man years in interoperability debugging and billions of dollars in prevented exploits. Next slide. So one issue that then comes up is um, the problem of composability. Um, now we've been we've been we've been talking all this time about what happens when uh, when two implementations end up producing a slightly different dialect. Now. Formally, why is this actually a problem? Um, this comes down to a thing called the context-free equivalence problem, which reduces to halting. If you have two context-free grammars, the question of whether they generate the same language is actually undecidable. There is one exception to this. Um, if, the, if the rules and the symbols in one grammar are a proper subset of the rules and the symbols in another grammar, then the first one, uh, then the language of the first one is a proper subset of the language of the second one. Um, so this was this was actually proved uh, in the Dejector paper back in 2005. But if your implementation is not generating its parser directly from the grammar, then you have absolutely no way to guarantee that you are in fact generating or parsing the correct language. You have just hit yourself upside the head with an undecidable problem. And it gets even worse when you start tacking, when you start tacking protocols together. So let's say, for instance, that, uh, you know, I, that I'm building a network stack. So all right, I'm going to need to handle IP. I'm going to need to handle TCP. I'm going to need to handle UDP. I'm probably going to need to handle HTTP and you know, a bunch of other application layer protocols as well. OK, great. Now let's look at the, the big, broader system. You know, even, even if I've done my entire system correctly, even if, I, even, if I, even if I have created provably correct, provably verifiable parsers and state machines for every single one of my protocols and made sure that end to end, they are, they are provably correct, like in the, in, the, in the good old Floyd Hoare proof rule sense, then I throw it out on the internet and I'm having to deal with everybody else's probably borked implementation. The problem of whether my system will actually interoperate in a non-exploitable way with everybody else is suddenly undecidable because we're all operating from different grammars. So we must we need a drum roll here. <laughs> uh, every now and 
then the uh, developer community comes up with a silver bullet, test-based programming, or any one of those, or unit testing, right? Behavior-driven development. Um, just how successful is any of that going to be in handling what is an undecidable, in approaching a solution, in getting any closer to a solution? Uh, I, I have a saying that, uh, that, I, that I like to answer people with when they ask me whether something is difficult, which is, you know, NP-complete is just hard. We don't get worried until it's undecidable. But yes, this, this problem, that, this, this broader problem of treating the internet as an enormous state machine really is an undecidable problem, and it will continue to be completely intractable until we get to the point where we are all working from the same basic boilerplate that's defined in the damn RFCs in the first place. Which is our answer to how do we get closer to an unexploitable internet. All right, so how the hell can we fix all of this? I've covered the, this needs to be defined. This needs to be defined in a machine readable fashion. It needs to be defined in a widely available, consistent specification. But it's worth saying again, so we do. Protocols. When I use the word protocol, I don't just mean wire protocols. I also mean any instance where Alice and Bob are trying to communicate. This is wire protocols. It's also file formats. All of these attacks we've talked about, all these classes of attacks, they apply to PDF. They apply to image file formats. They apply to file system encodings. They Java bytecode. <laughs> then we get in to, yes, scripts, which are, of course, a nightmare because most of them are talking about Turing complete applications. You need to somehow bound the complexity of your, of your program so that you can represent it in uh, a, a grammar that you, can actually, that you can actually put bounds on. How I would go about doing this, so we're talking about verification shims at file handling components. Delegate that to the operating system, make it so no program actually opens files itself. Instead, it issues a system call. And when the system is doing a verification, or when doing an open on, say, your JPEG files, it validates the, that the input is correctly formed. And if it's not, you can possibly fall back on treat everything as an opaque blob. But you don't want to have unvalidated inputs being interpreted and parsed. That way leads to remote code execution. The shim approach is a good way to get started and get these out there, but it's not an all-encompassing solution. So we're looking at, can we put this into the kernel? Can we build a hypervisor system that handles and not just external inputs, but also message passing, passing between processes. And that, of course, is an ambitious project, building a hypervisor that verifies that any communication protocol, inner process to network to file system, is performed and checked against a reference grammar before any possibility of exploit is, is a multi-year, many-person project. But I think that something along these lines is necessary if we want to avoid winding up with an internet that goes the way of, of Usenet, is a malware ghetto, is a spam neighborhood, and all of your real computing and all of your real network actions take place in a, in a restricted environment. Uh, we have two possible futures. One, the Google Net, where you don't get to execute any code of your own. It all has to be code signed and verified by the TPM, and if you don't have that, you don't connect to the net. Walled garden nanny approach, or we somehow figure out how to fix the rampant malware problem. Formal grammar validation is a way to get there. But we need to cut off the execution of malware at a higher level than we've been doing it so far. 
we can't simply be responding to sim single instances of attacks. Oh, buffer overflows are a problem, so let's, let's deal with specifically addressing that. Oh, double free errors are a problem, so let's specifically deal with that. We've got to back up a level, get ahead of the curve, and make it so that the attacker simply can't get his code to where it needs to be to exploit these problems. Because we're not going to ever have, there is no such thing as a bug-free program once you pass a certain number of lines. And we're not going to have a world where buffer overflows never happen. We need to have a world where the attacker can't exploit the buffer overflows because he cannot get his data to the target. So that's, that's a glimpse of the promised land in the future. I'm certainly happy to hear suggestions on how to how to get there. And if anyone has any questions, now's the time. So I guess one thing that worries me a bit is that it's, it seems to have been said with the idea in mind that the art, the the BNF parameters and the RFCs are the axiomatic forms that the rest of the RFC flows out of. And it's not positive to me that that's the case, because isn't the case in a lot of RFCs it's that not currently it, the case. In fact, that no. uh, and in all RFCs that the EBNF parameters come from the are an afterthought to the text itself, and thus the EBNF parameters is wrong? Yes. Currently, RFCs do not do what we need them to do when we're talking about RFCs providing a machine readable reference grammar. That's not done. The existing EBNF provided in the RFCs is a, an example of how you would do this, but it needs, to, it needs to be built upon. Right now, these are references to augment the English language written protocol specifications. We need to have a, the canonical, the canonical implementation specification, though, is the English. That's what we want to change. Yeah, so you're right that it does need to be not bolted on. It needs to be what you start with. I mean, anybody, anytime somebody comes to me and says, hey, Meredith, can you take a look at this protocol I've written? The first thing I say is, well, where's your BNF? And usually they say to me, uh, I didn't write one. And I said, then you did it wrong. Go back, start over, write the BNF first, then write the, so then tell me in English what the protocol does. May I, may I ask a question? Now, uh, haven't you just destroyed the concept of validating a piece of software? Because you can validate a piece of software, you can have it FIPS uh, or common criteria validated, and it will be totally formally um, uh, analyzed and uh, you know, pass whatever it is. And then you have another piece of equally well validated uh, software. Has the composition been validated? Uh, so the people who, are, who spend all that time on validating the first piece and the second piece, and you know what is the cost of that process? Well, it's pretty large, right? So when they put those things in communication, where does all of this money go that was spent in validating those problems? Those, those two pieces of software. Well, the money goes into bureaucrats' coffers. <laughs> well, um, uh, let's just say, where did the value created by all of this validation go? I, I don't think there was any value created in the first place. I mean, it's, a, it's an illusion. I, I'm not sure I'd say that. There, there is, having been through a FIPS, pro, the, the FIPS validation process, there, there is certainly value in any code audit in any formal review, but it is not and should not be thought of as an end goal where once you go through these steps, once you fill out these forms, once you run these, these test val uh, validations, you have at the end of the day a piece of software that you can say this is, this is bulletproof. That's that kind of thinking is just going to leave you disappointed. But going back to, to your slide with the form, uh, we don't need to see it. There was the final, uh, Bob turned and understood. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to make sure that he hears 
produce the right stuff. I'm not making any understanding. Understanding it is quite different. For example, in uh, I think probably most of the parsers for POSIX's uh, regular expressions, which are fairly borough things, probably do understand the grammar of regular expressions. The B and F. But every one of those processors interprets the regular expression, uh, recognizes a different language. Given the same regular expression, which was legitimate. Right. Now, obviously, our ultimate goal is to make sure that what Bob ends up understanding is actually what Alice thought in the first place. And as Len mentioned, you know, in the beginning, every piece of the every every piece of this sequence has room for something to get for, for something to get done wrong. And you know, the, the the channel between what Alice says and what Bob hears is something that people have been working on for, for decades. I mean, you know, the, this all started with Claude Shannon. Uh, working on error correcting codes, um, figuring out how to figuring out how to quantify information, and you know, on on noisy channels, what gets lost? You know, the error correcting codes exist in order to in order to make sure that what is said and what is heard are close enough to the same thing. And it's really really the parsing step is where you get from what's heard to what's understood. You can think of gener you can you can think of of generation as parsing backwards. So. If you're if you're using the exact same template for going from what Alice thinks to what Alice says, and going from what Bob hears to what understands, then as long as you didn't have any loss in the middle, you've at least got the you've, you're at least going from the same you know, you're at least going from the same parse tree back out to the same parse tree. Now the next question is the state machine, right? And it's certainly the case that you know that that Bob can screw up the state machine. And even with the correct, even with the correct, the, the, with the correctly parsed input, still end up with the incorrect result, because the because the sequence of states was not actually correct. But that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. I mean, we're not trying to present a silver bullet. One of our goals is to get implementers thinking about this problem so that they realize if they can bound the complexity of their of their grammar, if they can keep, if you can do what you need to do using a regular regular expression set, and you don't need a context-free grammar, then stay down at the regular level. As soon as you have a protocol that needs to be context-sensitive or context-free, you're giving much, much greater computing power to the attacker to play with. You're widening his, his, uh, his playground there. And if you're restricted to just just regular expressions, then his malicious actions are also just restricted to the corresponding computing machine. That is that the LBA is. Um, uh, sorry, for which one? For context, regular, uh, regular is uh, is DFAs. DFAs. Yeah. So he can do any if he 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 he's guaranteed not to be able to do anything beyond what he could do with the DFA. As soon as you add capability to your protocol, you're adding capability to the interpreter and thus adding capability that the attacker can leverage. I mean, it's also important for protocol designers and systems designers to look at the complexity of the state machine that's behind the, 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 that's behind the grammar, right? Because these are two completely separate things. If all you're providing to the, if all you're providing to the user is you know, a simple push down automata, that's a lot less. That's a lot less wiggle room than a full Turing machine. So, as long as you're not, uh, as, as long as you're not giving them that much room, as long as you're not giving people that much room to hang themselves, the likelihood of them hanging themselves is considerably smaller. You had a question. Uh, well, I, I had two questions. One of which I, I guess really overlapped a lot with, with Doug's question. Uh, uh, you mentioned the example of. Uh, of JPEG, and uh, so uh, you know, it, it seems like a great idea to have these strategic points where you, I guess, you talk about putting shims in, so you would, you know, validate the grammar. But as, as Doug was sort of implying, you could still have an implementation of a correct uh, JPEG 
And there might be cases of JPEGs that would be legitimate, but somewhat uncommon, where different implementations would handle them differently, and some of them would sort of get into trouble because they, you know, there's something tricky about about handling that case. So I, I guess that's just a reiteration of Doug's point. It falls back to the the problem of dialects and where you're going to find exploitable differences is usually in the unusual cases. Um, it doesn't help that JPEG is also a particularly ugly grammar. Right, right. Um, I, was, I was actually working on a parser combinator based implementation of JPEG pretty recently and uh, I haven't exactly given up but I, I did tear out some hair and said I'll come back to this. It's not quite as bad as PNG because that one actually requires permutation combinators. But which the, the <laughs> which you don't get here in here is even in the obscure cases, you want to have consistent behavior between implementations. So if we're able to specify this formally, when you hit an edge case that somebody probably wouldn't have thought of when writing the English, as long as everyone's interpretation of the, the formal grammar specification is the same, then you should get the same behavior. That may still be something that's that's useful to an attacker, but at least they won't be able to leverage different behavior between implementations. Well, right, but, but I guess it's tricky to implement, and then, then you know, the parser generator is going to, is going to you know, parse for it, it's going to figure an AST, but then you have to implement, you know, the action based on right. the AST, and so other people can make mistakes there. But I, I guess another question that's raised is, is uh, if you have a number of different parser generators out there, what if they have different implementations that have different bugs in them? And uh, I, you know, I, I guess it reduces the the number of different individual exploits, but or, or breaks them into you know categories at least. But do, do you worry about that problem? Yes, but that said, um, I mean, there are. Th this is this is where formal verification of semantics comes in with respect to proof rules, at least in functional languages, you have the ability to prove the correctness of a program. And I mean, you, ha you have to consider things like, you know, Don Knuth's warning of, you know, do not rely on this, do not rely on this code, I have only proven it correct, not tested it. But it does get you a, it, it does get you a long way to be able to prove the, to be able to prove that, say, the code which the, the code which this parser generator generates is guaranteed to be an accurate, uh, an accurate implementation of this particular grammar. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's harder in you know side effect full languages like C, but the world seems to be moving away from those. We hope. <laughs> so um, since Ed uh, uh, will not be here, I will uh, hear his comment. Uh, he um, uh, he is the one that uh, who I first heard the phrase uh, security is not composable mm -hmm. from, and uh, it occupied me for quite a while. And uh, basically, when you hear something like that, you want to reduce it to NP completeness or decidability, something that's provably hard. And so. When I was in that uh, hacker conference talk, it hit me that uh, this is indeed what happens here. You put, you compose two stacks in the communicating system, and suddenly you end up in the formal requirement for security is that they be computationally equivalent in the way they parse certain things. And uh, lo and behold, you end up with an undecidable problem. And this actually kind of takes us back to um, what I was saying a little bit earlier um, about, uh, yeah, about formal correctness and uh, properties that you can prove with that. You know, because if you're, if you're going to be composing several, uh, several pieces together into one larger system, then you have to ask the question, all right, well, uh, what, is this, what is this actually closed under? Um, if you're, if you're, if, if for instance, um, you're dealing with, um, if you're dealing with languages that all fall into categories of the Chomsky hierarchy that are closed under, say, concatenation, then you're, then, 
as long as you're talking about a data flow that goes from one to two to three to four, then you're fine. Um, if, if, you're t if, if you're talking about stuff that's closed under reversal or uh, um, what's the technical term for palindrome that I'm thinking of going forwards and backwards? Anyway, never mind. Uh, so yeah. the pal palindromes of uh, ones and zeros are already, uh, uh, already uh, require a non-deterministic push-down automaton. Right. And this is where... This is where you start to get into trouble. Yeah, this is exactly... This is, uh, so uh, uh, if, my, uh, if my memory is correct, a deterministic push-down automata, you can prove... Uh, uh, so uh, proving computational equivalence is not undecided. No deterministic push down automata is where it gets to be undecidable. And this is like the brink over which the protocols who rely that rely on the um, on, on such power needed to parse them. Just will totally walk off the brink. And so uh, coming back to uh, security is not composable. It's always nice to know, just you know, how does the what, what is it? The fruit flies like a banana, right? <laughs> how how not composable are uh, are they? Well, they are not composable as in if it's a language that you need a certain computational power to parse. They are not composable as in undecided. Right. You will not be able to check the properties of the composition. Yeah, I mean this this also makes the case for you know for using formalisms like like parser combinators you know because we can prove that uh, you know we we can prove that parser combinators are in fact closed under composition. Any other questions? Well then, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker.